So we're right at five after 12 and um, I think we'll go ahead and get started. And if folks join, we can certainly catch them up. Um, thank you everyone for joining this afternoon. My name is Kathy Cornett. I work with Charlotte Planning Design and Development and I'm the Deputy Project Manager for the Charlotte Future 2040 Comprehensive Plan. Um, why don't we go ahead and get started by just introducing ourselves and I'll go ahead and run down my list of participants, um, hopefully in the order I see them. Sometimes that jumps around, but I'll do my very best. If I skip over you, please let me know. So um, Alicia, do you want to get us started with the introductions? Alicia Osborne, um, project manager for comp plan. Jennifer Murdoch. Hi, I'm Jennifer Murdoch. I'm with uh, one of the HOAs in South Charlotte. Jody. Um, I'm Jody Adams. I'm with uh, Northwest Community Alliance. Dave. Molinaro. Um, uh, Dave Molinaro here, uh, uh, East Side uh, activist. Um, John. Hey, I'm John Ryder with Charlotte Village. Lisa. Hi, I'm Lisa Swain Proud with the Plaza Midwood Neighborhood Association. Miss Maddie. Maddie Marshall, Historic Washington Heights Neighborhood Association and Hawena Historic West End Neighborhood Association. Susie. Hi, I'm Susie Taylor with the Northwest Community Alliance and also the Pawtucket Community Association. Weston. I am with the Stonington HOA as well as Nambets. So is it actually Scott, not Weston? Yeah, Weston is my middle name. My father and son okay, is Scott, okay. so okay. <laughs> you can call me right. Weston. Sorry, I, I recognize the lion. The lion. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Alberto. Alberto Gonzalez, uh, planning department staff. Catherine. Uh, how about Aaron? How about Maddie Pleasant? Um, Maddie Pleasant, I'm with planning staff as well. Uh, Melba? Melba Merritt? Hi, my name is, oh, let's see. can you hear me? Yes, uh-huh. Okay. Uh, my name is Melba Merritt and I am, um, president of Brookmere HOA. Okay, thank you so much. So I think I've gotten everybody, if I skipped over someone, feel free to jump in and correct me. But um, part of what we're doing with these conversations is um, different groups that, you know, I think most of you have um, participated in either investors and strategic advisors or some other um, sort of outreach that we've done. There's a variety of different things that we've done. These are really focused on hearing what your concerns are and what you have to say. So I don't have a formal presentation prepared. Um, certainly I do have slides that we can refer to if, if um, you know, there's some sort of question, but I think really what we wanna focus on here are, you know, what are your concerns? What are things you like about the plan? Um, what are questions you might have? And I'm hoping that we can do that, even though I know, you know, although we're pretty used to Zoom, um, that can be a little bit difficult. So I don't know if um, the group is fairly small. I don't think we need to do the raising hands thing, but if that helps facilitate it, we can certainly do that. Um, also, feel free to use the chat and I'll try to monitor that, but otherwise, um, why don't we jump in and get started and if there's someone that is, you know, ready to share their thoughts, um, we're happy to hear those. Hmm. Could you like uh, give us a brief 
overview of what you know uh, the planning involves as far as the, the, the completion date or the projected dates to get everything done? Sure. So we are in phase four of the um, plan process. So we've been developing the comprehensive plan since the fall of 2018. Um, and starting, you know, in the fall of 2018 was really vision and values um, kind of moved into phase two and refining that. And we've had community input along the way. So obviously, input wise, we started with being able to do a whole lot of stuff in person all the way through phase three, um, which was around this time last year and um, then shifted to the virtual environment, which is where we are now. So uh, phase three involved really like taking all the input we've heard in phase one and two, developing policies and recommendations and actually physically producing a document, which we released on October 31st of 2020. So the plan document, if, if you haven't, been, haven't seen it, we're happy to put a link to it in the chat. There's a whole lot of things around just the document. There's an e-version, there's a hard copy version, there's an executive summary, there's a virtual open house, et cetera. Um, so the phase that we're in right now is focused on comments around the plan. And um, obviously for the past four months, we've you know been cataloging all of those comments. We have about 260-ish comments thus far. Some of them have been on the e-plan. Some of them have been emailed. We also, you're um, welcome to provide comments by snail mail and also over the phone. And most of the comments have revolved around the policy framework. And, um, you know, they've been not only from the public, but from elected and appointed officials and also our staff, because in developing the comprehensive plan, it's providing a guide to the growth and development for the city's future. And that's not only the planning department, it's you know all the different departments within the city and then our partner agencies and the county and um, other agencies that are, that are not affiliated um, with local government in any way. So um, from this point, we are hoping that you know what the schedule is, is for there to be formal public comment in front of both the Planning Commission and City Council later in the month and into April with a goal of having it adopted at the end of April. Does that answer your question? Yes, yes, you can go ahead, I'm sorry. So, do, do I have any takers on any thoughts on the plan? Um, have you um, had a chance to look at it? Do you have thoughts? I know Alicia has posted in the chat the link to, to the plan website. Um, and then again, there's an executive summary there and there's also an e-plan of the entire, you know, 300 page document. Okay. Hello. Hello, this is Maddie. Hey, Miss Man. I've enjoyed working with the plan over the past three years. And I'm just going to start currently. You know, I enjoy the game, uh, the building your city game. Um, but the things that I'm looking at is around the neighborhoods, neighborhood one, neighborhood two, building, um, I guess the 10 minute type neighborhoods. I enjoy that concept. I also really want us to be serious about equity and inclusion and making sure that we are not building communities of the future that will result in displacement whether that's in the zoning component, but be mindful of that. Um, and then I like the, you know, how we have the Charlotte moves or the transit components. 
So looking at the different components of of every aspect of the city. So that's what I want to leave for this moment. I have other comments a little bit later. Thank you. So I think you've started out with probably the areas that we've received the most comments on thus far. Um, the 10 minute neighborhood, I think, you know, most of the comments have been positive about that, but for some others, you know, the 10 minutes they feel like is a little too intense for wherever they, they live. Um, and then definitely the neighborhood diversity and inclusion um, and the conversation around um, expanding single family housing. So around that, what I would say, I think one of our goals is, is really at this point, getting accurate information out there about what is actually recommended in the plan. And so we have an ambassador toolkit that mm -hmm. um, has messages around that, that we hope that folks will share. But, you know, whatever decision you make on a personal basis or for your particular place in our community, we just want that to be made on, on um, accurate information about what actually the plan does say. Um, and I Susan, just want to add. That go ahead, Ms. Madden. Then Ms. Susan, Susan Taylor has her hand up, Kathy, after Ms. Madden speaks. I think with, I think a better understanding of what's involved in, say, neighborhood one, neighborhood, or the neighborhood type two, uh, we currently have, you know, a mixed use of neighborhoods anyway, meaning we have the, you know, the duplexes. I know in our particular neighborhood, whether it's a duplex, whether it's a quadplex. So it's a mixture, mixture of the type of, of homes in, in the neighborhood one. And also through some of our historic neighborhoods, we have that combination. Say in Wesley Heights, you have quadplexes, maybe Myers Park, you have different areas with a mixture of neighborhood one and neighborhood two and everything must be you know completed with quality dignity and the right architecture styles and components thank you thank you miss maddie susan did you have something you wanted to share hi y'all um i'm kind of late to the ball game and i apologize for that but you know, we've started the Northwest Community Alliance and that's kind of like our portion of the Freedom Division. And um, we have had a lot of petitions coming up to change zonings. And uh, we're trying to get away from like warehouse commercial and have more and really fight for more single family housing. And so it's been going around our social medias that you guys are because of, I think a Pat McCrory had an interview with someone that uh, they're wanting to do away with eliminate single family zoning and, you know, put up all of these, you know, different apartments or things like that. And so I just, it, I realized I need to really get involved and see what's going on because we have not, we have like one grocery store here. <laughs> we have nothing. And so a group of us have gotten together as community leaders and, and we're gonna fight petitions, anything we can to make sure that our side of town has a better quality of living. So um, I'm excited to hear what all of you guys have to say. Thank you. So I don't know if um, someone on, on staff is able to post in the chat the link to the 10 minute neighborhood policy that's in the plan, but basically what you're getting at with being able to access grocery stores and other services that you need on a daily basis um, that's where the 10 minute neighborhood comes into play. And it's basically saying that you should have access to the goods and services that you need on a daily basis. And that includes not only retail services, but jobs and other things um, by a 10 minute walk, bike ride, transit trip or um, vehicular trip. So um, that's that particular policy. And that's goal number one. And then goal number two is neighborhood diversity and inclusion, which is where a lot of the conversation is happening around um, what's framed as elimination of single family zoning. But 
I would say it's not elimination, it's a broadening of that perspective. So allowing duplexes and triplexes um, within neighborhoods, which as Ms. Maddie mentioned, we have in a lot of our older neighborhoods already today. Um, so the kind of the height of producing those kind of, you know, they exist in, you can find them in Plaza Midwood and um, the West Side. Um, I think Ms. Maddie mentioned Dilworth, Myers Park, some of the older neighborhoods inside Route 4, um, they're very prevalent. You don't notice them because they fit in with what the setbacks are in heights and other things um, that you would find in um, similar to just a single family house. But the idea being that not everyone um, at whatever point in life they're in um, is able to maintain or has the need for a single family home. So you may be someone right out of college, you want to, you know, go back and, you know, start the rest of your life in the neighborhood you grew up in, but you don't have the need for a single family home. On the other end of the spectrum, you may have aged out of a single family home. You may be an empty nester or a single person and don't have that need either. But again, you don't want to leave your neighborhood. So it's really kind of broadening how we look at, at that. Um, it doesn't eliminate single family construction. It doesn't say that won't happen anymore. It just says that um, there are other housing types that are appropriate in our neighborhoods. So I hope that helps a little bit. We do have um, messaging around kind of what accurate information is around what's contained in the plan. And the plan is a policy document. I, I think that's important to mention too. It's not a regulatory document. So adoption of the plan would not change your zoning. Um, it's, it's policies based on where we want our community to grow, how we want our community to grow over the next 20 years. The next and the, step. The planning of this, is it community driven or um, do, how, how much of a say so do, does the community have in this, this plan and the development of, of what it is you're wanting to do? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's, it's completely community driven. And so um, I don't know whoever has the slides up if you want to skip back, yeah. I think like three slides before this kind of shows. Um, We've had robust community input and that's really been at the forefront of, of the plan from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. So you can see um, all the areas that we've touched. We've focused on getting people access to information and pe meeting people where we are. So we've been very mindful of each phase of the plan and each time we've done community engagement, going back and seeing Who's, who are we not reaching and what are better ways to reach them? So that all kind of focuses on the 40 plus different methods of engagement. We've done, you know, back in times when we were able to meet in person, we did pop-up events, we did your traditional um, community open houses or community meetings. Um, in addition to that, we met with focus groups, church groups, um, all of those types of things, obviously, we, and then in addition to that, we have a 400 and something plus member um, ambassador and strategic advisors group that we've been meeting with. Obviously, you know, almost this time last year, we had to very quickly shift to a different environment and virtual environment. We've um, continued to do meetings like this that we're doing today. And we've realized that we need to do them at different times. We need to reach out to certain segments of the population, which is, you know, again, what we're doing today is focusing on neighborhoods. We focused on um, faith-based organizations, um, those who serve certain segments of the population like arts groups or this um, disabled community, all of those types of things. Um, in addition to that, we've had a very heavy social media presence that we've continued to bolster. We've been on the radio, we've done podcasts, all of those different types of things. So I think engagement to your point has really have been the focus. 
And the plan is built off of the engagement that we've done from the very beginning. Thank you very much for that explanation. You're, you're welcome. And don't forget to mention the uh, ambassador's toolkit. Yeah, so the ambassador's toolkit, and somebody may have been able, let me look in the chat here too. It's in the chat. Yeah, there is a link to it. So that has, what that is, is ready-made um, uh, media and other things, you know, posts that you can, graphics, um, narratives, uh, all kinds of things. Um, factual information around the single family expansion conversation, all the things that you would need if you are a neighborhood leader or if you just want to get the word out to your neighborhood ready made for you to post on social media, include in a newsletter or an email to your group. All of it is ready made there for you so you're not having to create those, those items. Are there other thoughts or other questions that folks might have? I think they would need to walk through the neighborhood diversity thing just to, sure. yeah. just to really yeah. drive, drive that point home. I think that's a lot of why we're here. <laughs> there we go. So, um, What's actually in the plan around goal two, which goal two is directed at neighborhood diversity and inclusion was, is that Charlotte will strive for all neighborhoods to have a diversity of housing options by increasing the presence of middle density housing. So, and that means duplexes, triplexes, quadplexes, townhomes, accessory dwelling units and other. So it doesn't mean that um, there will be no more single family, I'm going to um, state that forthright, but from the very beginning of phase one of our plan and uh, the neighborhood engagement, the community engagement that we've done, we've had continuously rise to the top, folks desiring and, you know, or highlighting the need for affordable housing and sort of what we call missing middle housing. And so Affordable housing in and of itself is a very broad issue. You know, you can't attack it from one policy or from one angle and, and solve that problem. But from a land use standpoint, one way to get at it is broadening um, the types of housing that are available in, in our neighborhood. So part of this is responding to that and also the kind of missing middle idea, which is Really what I was talking about earlier with, it's not just an affordability um, issue. It's also folks just not needing, you know, let's face it, a single family home, it's a lot of work. Um, it's, it's something that is not appropriate for everyone at every point in their life. So you, you may enjoy living in a particular part of town, but you, you, you don't have the need to live in a single family home. So it's kind of getting at that as well, like wanting to stay and age in place or kind of move into a different segment of your life in the part of town that you're comfortable living in and the need for different types of housing in order for folks to be able to do that. So um, I think also I would mention that a lot of folks have had issues with, well, there's not kind of, or questions about there's not enough specifics around that. Um, last night, uh, another staff member and I met with uh, the Cherry neighborhood and sort of outlined that. So it, it's really two parts. The comprehensive plan policy-wise really gives you the framework for that and it's, it's broad. There's not a whole lot of specifics. We partner that with our toolkit to implement it, which is on the zoning side and the other land development regulations that would be in the unified development ordinance, which is another um, um, project that's going on right now, kind of on the heels of this particular project. So 
the um, specifics around that really would be in the zoning ordinance because a lot of folks are saying well what what does that exactly mean like context sensitive or um, the idea that duplexes and triplexes fit within the single family neighborhood so the things that would make duplexes and triplexes fit within the neighborhood are your side yards, your heights, um, how far it's set back from the street, where the driveway's located, where the parking's located. All of those regulations would be in the zoning ordinance. So in order for the zoning regulations to be written, they have to be based on what our goals and values are, which and policies, which are what is in the comprehensive plan. So um, that's kind of the image that you see here, kind of illustrating to you that, you know, number one may be a duplex and number two may be a triplex, but if you kind of look at it at a glance or really more than a glance, it's not very evident because they have the same qualities as far as the built environment goes. Same with the accessory dwelling unit. And, and again, this illustration here just just acknowledges that um, a range of building types not only increases the affordability options, but in, you know improves inequities, um, meets a variety of people at where they are in their particular point in life, and creates more inclusive neighborhoods. And so I mentioned this earlier, but there are a lot of these units already in our neighborhoods um, across the city. Um, a majority of them, like kind of the high point of those being constructed was around the 50s. And then um, since, you know, the early part of 2000, there's really been less of those built. And probably a lot of that has to do with what our zoning regulations are today. And then I, I've got a question I was going to ask. Um, so, in a just to back up a bit, so basically, what we're saying here is uh, we would like to perhaps put duplexes, triplexes, fourplexes of the on lots that typically <clears throat> uh, uh, held single family units. So, what I'm seeing is I'm seeing a, a condensing of families. Uh, on, on, they're not on the same area. And <clears throat> obviously, they're, they're, uh, uh, I don't know if they're going to be owner occupied. Obviously, someone's going to own the building and they'll be using the, the, the units for as income property. What I've come to find, and I'm having an issue like in my own neighborhood here, is we're tending to see a trend where we prefer owner occupants owner occupancy because there tends to be a bit more of a, a, a personal investment into the community uh, as opposed to uh, having, you know, renter occupied or, or income properties, basically. Um, and, and my question is this, and what we're doing here in my neighborhood is we're, we're trying to get our, our minds around or get everybody involved in something that's going to bring people together with an understanding that, hey, listen, even though you don't own this property, you guys might have the same landlord, but we're all a community. And only as a community, we're gonna be able to maintain uh, our, our, our neighborhoods. Uh, um, <clears throat> a lot less neglect, uh, more uh, involvement uh, with, with programs and stuff like that to, to get more of a pride thing going within that community. For example, if you have in the neighborhood, it's typically single families. Uh, but you turn that, you have four families now living in the same space as a single family, but there's a lot of congestion there. Do you have anything, uh, how do you say, peripheral to that particular, you know, a, a building that they can go to as a community to help put together plans so they can do something so that they can personally invest themselves and their family into that community to help you know, strengthen it, help beautify it, to help, you know, keep it up as opposed to decline, uh, where, you know, if, if you have people that are not caring about their apartment, hey, it's not my house, I, I pay my landlord rent, so I don't really care about this, you know, I'm not going really to put too much personal investment or involvement in the community, I'm just here to pay my rent, go to work, go to school, what have you. Do we have anything in place so that when we do bring these multiple families together, 
in these, you know, uh, how to say limited size areas where they can go to as an outlet to help, you know, uh, submit ideas. Hey, I got an idea for the community. Why don't we do this? So we can bring a general sense of unity within that area and thereby, you know, not only strengthen, you know, your neighborly bonds, but it, it can also help keep that area, how do you say, uh, uh, desirable. Is sure. there anything else? <clears throat> That's basically what I was asking. Yeah, sure. Alicia, did you have something? To yeah, yeah, I have to take take a stab at this one. And um, Scott, is that that right? I got the name right because. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's my, say uh, something different. my, no, my, 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 I'm sorry. Uh, my, my, I'm a junior. My father's a senior and my son's the third. So I oh, my friends wow. they, they, they call me Weston, you know, so that's, that's right. That's my go-to, but you can call me Scott by all means, you know, call me Scott okay. or Weston. <laughs> and thank, thank you for your question. And I think mm -hmm. um, Susan is echoing the, the concern. I think what, so what we're proposing in the plan, and again, it's a policy document, it will not build or um, tear down or eliminate any current single family. That That is completely up to um, the property owner or, uh, or the market to make that happen. What the plan does and what the regulations will allow is um, for that housing type to, to possibly occur, um, in the same type of character and building footprint. So, um, and that type of thing. What the plan does not address um, particularly is um, uh, rents, um, ownership type, like that policy, docu policy documents don't address that. But what it does address is, and, on a, and not in the same area of the plan, is how to support neighborhoods. We have a whole department that um, supports existing neighborhoods with grants and, and programs um, uh, that are available to homeowners or occupants that allow them to make improvements to their property, to, um, to do um, community-based events or community-driven events. So there's a, a support system around whatever type of ownership there is, but it supports the neighborhood in, in a more comprehensive way to your point, how we, as we grow and intensify and get more people in a place, how do we support that place and keep it vibrant? So the plan speaks a lot about, not just housing, but um, jobs and community placemaking and transportation, not just rail, but sidewalks and bike lanes and, and parks and how to support creating a complete community. So it's, it's, it's a, there are various things in there that help support that. To your point, it's not just about the building, but it's supporting the people in the place as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, okay, Kathy, you want to? walk through the next few slides just to kind of pin yeah sure do the um so here as i mentioned earlier um a lot of the specifics again are in the udo section or in the zoning section because i think that's what people, <clears throat> some people are looking for in the comprehensive plan but you won't find those those legal requirements or those specifics in this particular plan, but you'll find them in the zoning ordinance, which is part of our implementation tools. But again, this illustration um, shows the different mix of building types. And, and, you know, again, like I mentioned earlier, that they would be, um, have similar setbacks and heights and other things so that they, you know, all cohesively work together. And again, like the same setbacks and building yards, driveways, or wouldn't be a bunch of parking in the front, all of those types of things. Kathy? Yes. A quick question. How will this tie into, how will this tie into, um, the historic 
district areas, Charlotte right. historic districts? Yeah, that's a great question. So the historic districts really are more on the UDO side and they will exist there in overlay district today. That means that, you know, the property, each of the properties that are in a historic district, they're zoned for something. More often than not, it's single family or some sort of residential zoning. And then the overlay is, is another um, set of requirements that's placed on top of those. So that will continue to operate in the same way that it does today. They may be, um, there may be some sort of changes in those requirements or how the overlay works, but generally speaking, it'll operate the same way that it does today. In addition to that, on the UDO side, they're looking at sort of expanding that tool to a neighborhood conservation district. So that would say that there's some component of a particular neighborhood and it's the interest in pursuing that comes from the property owners or the neighborhood, not from our staff um, to, you know, protect some sort of component of the neighborhood. So it would be a neighborhood conservation overlay that functions very similar to a historic district overlay, but it doesn't necessarily say that the properties have to be historic in order to um, place that overlay and protect whatever component of that neighborhood, be it like how the homes are situated on the property, um, you know, the height of them, some sort of component like that. And to just to, just to add to that too, along those lines about um, designations, if you your neighborhood has HOA restrictions or there are covenants or restrictive covenants or any type types of codes that say what you can and cannot do within your neighborhood, this plan or any uh, will not override that at all. Um, mm. it, that that that's that's something else that has been circulating. That this plan will change the codes and um, override homeowners association regulations and covenants. That's not true. Um, I, I just wanted to put that part out there. Nor will um, any future zoning de designations change that unless there's some agreement amongst what you guys might have in place. Um, that you want to seek that change, but that is not something that this document or any initiative uh, from the city will, will supersede or either intercede in, in that process. So I wanted to be clear about that. So I think it's hard to tell who's next, but Miss, I think Susie had a question, Jody, and then Jennifer. Uh, no, ma'am, you answered my question. I just don't know how to put my little hand down. Oh, yeah. Oh. I think you go back into the reactions and I think you click it again. Yeah. Yeah, I took Very it down. Very confusing. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> so it looks like Jennifer, yeah. Yeah. Hi, thank you. Um, you actually just answered my question in reference to the HOA because that is definitely a conversation that has been had in the meetings with folks that participate in events like this or people who are involved in other community efforts. They've heard this. So that's great to know. But I did have a question in reference to the modifications that would be made in neighborhoods where they could add multiplex. How are the schools and the traffic patterns being handled? Because we, I live in South Charlotte, so I'm technically in the Valentine community. And as you know, our area has had tremendous growth. And every day there's another cone or another men working sign to address roads or infrastructure. And I was in the last in-person zoning meeting for an area off of Community House Road by the YMCA and Bryan Farms and the plan that they were going to do there. And they have added 200 units in which was formerly a single family property. And the question came up then, how are we handling the traffic in the schools? And when they see this broad plan, especially for some of the neighborhoods that have been 
around for a long time, you know, how are you going to, they have, you know, very narrow streets and they have limited parking and they maybe only have stop signs and no traffic lights. I was wondering how that was going to be addressed and who was going to be presenting it. So that's a great question. And I would say that as part of the plan, it's not just the planning department. We've worked with other departments and there's um, other plans that are going on at the same time. So we have reached out as part of developing the policies within the plan to Charlotte Mecklenburg Schools, which you know is a separate entity from the city, but we work together as much as we can. Um, and one thing we've shared is, you know, growth projections and other things to kind of help. They, they have a different timeline for projecting growth. It's, you know, this is a 20 year plan for them looking out far is, is five years, um, just by nature of what they, what they do. But the, um, growth projections and other things and um, that we've done as background information to this plan is, is, is helpful to them and can help them plan more um, for student growth. And, you know, really their student enrollment hasn't actually increased that much over the years. It really kind of shifts around based on where kind of like more growth is happening within our community. So that this, all of the information and the data that we produce will help them better plan for um, student populations here on out. From the traffic side, it's really providing a variety of um, options for folks, obviously. So not just, you know, getting somewhere by car, but in addition to that, at the same time, the Charlotte Department of Transportation is producing a strategic mobility plan um, in tandem with this particular plan. And we're folding those recommendations in, into our plan. And they're mindful of what our policy recommendations are and crafting their recommendations as well. In addition to that, I don't know if you want to talk about it. Charlotte moves at all, Alicia, or? Um... Yeah, that's that's um, one component of the mobility plan um, that, you know, has gotten a lot of press around the transit tax and everything and, and to, pay, to pay for that plan. But on a more micro level, um, as development happen, happens, um, both departments, the our department who approves development, you know, via um, either by right, or via rezoning through city council and, and the, the, um, the Department of Transportation are looking at how do we anticipate growth better and then make sure that we invest in those uh, growth patterns in a more intentional way. And so a lot of what's in the Charlotte moves is thinking about here's what we know the growth is going to happen. Here's how we might pay and plan for that growth in those growth patterns. And that includes infrastructure around roads, to your point, um, Jennifer, um, intersections, sidewalks, uh, trails, all those facilities um, beyond just a rail line. But as the growth is happening in the short term, how do we be smarter about making those investments from the city side and then when private development happens as well, how do we partner to, to leverage those investments to make sure we're relieving traffic and connecting people in, in a more um, set, a safe way and, and actually um, a more environmentally friendly way as well. I think we forget about the environment component too, to uh, traffic and congestion. Great. Thank you so much. I appreciate it because um, uh, I think the environment, I had environment written down underneath my schools and traffic. So um, thanks for answering that. And I um, appreciate your information, both of you. There's a lot of um, recommendations in the plan, too, that um, uh, are from our strategic energy action plan, the, the CAP, as we call it internally. Um, that links and talks about carbon emission and how to reduce our carbon footprint with buildings and how to be, how to be more thoughtful about resiliency. 
And a lot of those recommendations or some of those will tie into um, how we would view our development, um, land development projects in the future too. So um, if you're looking at the e-plan online, you can, mm -hmm. do, you can do a word search for certain topics that you want to just kind of focus in on. And then it'll pop up, like if you just want to say energy or environment, um, the search will yield all the areas in the plan that speak to those topics that you're, you're specifically interested in. There was a question in the chat from John Wall. I'll read it. Um, will developers support or oppose this plan? Will the NC legislature need to approve the plan? Two part question. Um, so the first one is, will developers support or oppose the plan? Uh, John, I think a lot of, uh, if you guys watched council last night, um, a lot of the opposition and um, discussion were from comments from the development community. And I won't say the entire development community because um, there are, and we've heard from some developers that actually support key components of the plan. So it's, it's a little bit of a mixed bag, but we definitely know um, the loudest, what the loudest voice was in response to, to reaction from our council last night. So it's a little bit of, of, of both. Um, and um, will the NC legislature need to approve the plan? So it's a, a local policy document that does not require their approval. However, there are some parts of the plan, some elements or recommendations that in the future, um, when the plan is adopted, we would need some type of uh, legislative discussion or action. For example, there is a recommendation around inclusionary zoning, which is um, making it mandatory for affordable housing or uh, in, in, in Charlotte. So there are some communities within North Carolina that have the ability to do that. Charlotte does not. If we were to pursue that in the next 20 years, it will require some discussions and action by um, the legislature, but the plan will not um, will not need approval from the assembly um, to be approved. It's city council that will approve it. Does that answer your question adequately? It, 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 it does, and I thank you for that. And I want to say quickly that the Hidden Valley community um, um, introduced the I don't I don't want to say the concept of a multi-development for to, to, to other than apartments, something that would encourage home ownership because home ownership builds equity and it builds wealth for the, um, the especially for the African-American community that, that's, that's lacking. So I'm glad to see that. I hope there's something that can be implemented fairly soon in, in the Charlotte area as an alternative to apartment, all apartment dwelling development that's been experienced in the Hidden Valley community. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wall, for your, for your question and your comment. There's another, <laughs> there's another question and I'll let Kathy take this one. Janaris Washington, you wanna take that one, Kathy, and then I'll take the next one from sure. uh, Ms. Um, Draper. Yeah, and before Janaris says, I think Ms. Maddie had a comment about tree oh, yeah, canopy and I think, um, Ms. Maddie, I think you're on the tree canopy action plan stakeholder group, I think, but um, that, that component um, works again. There's a lot of other plans that are going on at the same time as the comprehensive plan. The comprehensive plan really serves as the umbrella document for those. And we are definitely um, in conversation with the other staff members that are developing those other plans, which may be more specific around an issue such as the environment that's contained in the comprehensive plan and then the tree at canopy action plan would get into more specificity around that. Um, in addition to that, Janaris had a question that said, how will we ensure that we truly balance each community where we don't have specific development taking over an entire area? Are we setting thresholds, for example, maximum 50% housing, 30% amenities, et cetera, to ensure we follow the 10 minute 
I think it probably says neighborhood concept. And, and that's a great point, um, 10 minute community, um, which I did not touch on was the equitable growth framework, which is an overarching component of, of this plan. And equity gets at in, in, I think what your question is, is that sense of balance. So um, making sure that all parts of our community are benefiting from growth. So growth and development has great things it brings and it also has some challenges that it brings. So how are we balancing that across our community to make sure that all parts of our community, um, not one part is paying for the growth in another part of our community that everyone is kind of um, able to benefit from um, the good things of development and then sharing whatever those, those challenges may be. And as part of that, as part of the implementation piece of the plan, we are going to um, actively have a dashboard and metrics so that we can measure how we are doing as far as the equitable measures across the community, as far as growth and development and where we need um, projects that are perhaps publicly, publicly funded capital investments in order to kind of bolster one, one section of the community a little bit more. Um, all of those things, that's, that's a very important component of this is, you know, once the plan is adopted, that would not by any means be the end of, of the work that we're doing. It really kind of launches us into the next phase so a big piece of that is, is measuring that and on an annual basis saying, here's what we said we're going to do. Are we doing it? You know, how successful were we? If we weren't successful, what are some ways that um, we can kind of change that course or do we need different, different tools in our toolbox, um, et cetera? I, I can't think I can add to that part. Um, and the important part of that is um, making sure that we are transparent about the whole process. Like I think creating a dashboard and everything, make sure that as we learn what's working, again, this is a 20 year plan. It's a living document. Um, there will be opportunities along the way to revise and evolve our thinking. And I think a lot of um, some of the fear is that this is a one and done type of situation. Um, and I think, um, you know, what, what we're saying in the plan is actually in writing. And, and what we're saying as staff on this call is that, um, that this is a living document. And as we learn and grow together, we'll modify and pivot to uh, support the, the vision of, of the neighborhoods and, and our businesses and just creating a vibrant community. I think Bobby Draper had a question about what is the proposed timeline for approval. You know what, Bobby? I thought I knew. <laughs> Last night when we presented to council, we had a good idea of um, a April um, a hearing in March, and then potentially uh, approval for the plan in April. That that has been the timeline that was established at the beginning of the project. Pandemic hit, slowed down just a little bit, and um, we're still in that six months, three months into a six month review period of the document. So um, that's where a lot of the robust conversation is happening. And um, if there is a delay, which I hear there is some energy around that, um, what I've heard is one to two months that had not, has not been confirmed but definitely expressed a desire to do so. Um, and not just delay, but what are we accomplishing in that delay too? I think that's in another part of the discussion that has not been had. Um, what is it that we hope to accomplish by delaying the plan? And what are the actions or tactics that need to happen to get us to that place where they're comfortable in making a, a decision? So that, TBD. Um, I did hear some of the council uh, discussion last night. Uh, probably didn't watch as much as you guys did, but I did want to 
thank Kathy for her comments that she just gave regarding, I guess, some of the metrics you're contemplating to measure the outcomes and equity and that kind of thing, and somewhat relate to what John said. So, you know, I was just curious about, and I'm in the development business, by the way, for some folks, just to give some perspective. And I develop in fuel urban housing. And so, you know, it seems to me that eliminating the single family zoning, although good for our industry, might challenge some uh, folks in terms of this kind of gentrification discussion. I just wonder, is there not a metric that might, you know, be imposed that says, and it'd be hard for y'all to monitor, but something such as, you know, if what's being rebuilt is kind of out of scale with what's there, there might be some limitation. You know, I kind of observed some of that discussion in, um, I guess, um, Oakland Park you know, about what they recently did. And it seems like it was a pretty strategic move and very good from a preservation standpoint. But I just wonder, is that possible for y'all uh, even at this late date to impose anything like that? I would imagine not. And certainly we had a lot of opportunity to express our thoughts. I know I'm a 12 hour you know, backseat driver, so I apologize. But, yep, you, you are, know, Bobby. Shame on you. <laughs> but I'm just curious. You know. Shame on you, Bobby. Same I know. I'm, I'm always <laughs> less of a party. You know, I'm, you know, I don't want to do the hard work. I'm sorry. I just got yeah. to do so. But thank no, you all no. for everything you brought up. So. Those, are, those are good questions. So, one, the plan does not eliminate single family housing or zoning. Let's be clear, those will still be allowed in future development should the developer choose to develop single family. So you as a developer, you can still build single family housing. Let's, let's be clear about that part. Second part is there are um, building, there's dimensional standards that will be in place. There are currently are, and there will be more to establish how those housing structures happen. Um, as, uh, we showed in the illustration, if there is a single family home and there's a vacant lot next to it and the property owner decides they want to build a duplex, the building dimensions, front yard, uh, rear yard, all of that will be consistent with the character of the neighborhood. So right, all that, that all right. establishes something um, and then that makes sure that whatever comes in is consistent with what's already there. One, two, there will be no parking in the front of the buildings. There are a lot of duplexes, quads and triplexes throughout Charlotte that have parking right there in the front. In new structures, what we're proposing in the ordinance at the plan says no parking in the front. Also, that there will be a shared driveway. So if there's four individual units, they won't have four driveways, increasing the impervious surface tremendously. There will be one shared driveway for the unit. And there are dimensional standards that make sure, um, regulations that make sure that whatever is built height, width, and in that footprint, that's consistent with the character of the neighborhood. Great, thank you so much for that explanation. And uh, sorry for my misstatement about single family going away, but thank you for You, you knew I was gonna come for you on that Yeah, one. you got me on that one. <laughs> you, can, you can actually Google a plan for eliminate and it's not even in the plan because that's not what we're doing. Again, we, we I live in a neighborhood, we support and want vibrant and thriving communities. All this plan talks about is how to support that. Charlotte is a city of neighborhoods and um, it's not trying to ruin that fabric in any way. It's not trying to um, eliminate the possibility of growing that. It's removing the barriers to providing diversity as we grow and, and, and being thoughtful about um, the character, the existing character and, and form in which that happens. Um, so that's what um, the plan really talks about. Thank you so much. Uh huh.
So I think, are we until one? We had a couple of questions in here that we didn't get to. So let me go back to those. Um, does the plan have energy in being made to expand? Wait, hold on a second. I'm sorry, I'm scrolling and reading. Does the plan have energy in the area of strengthening parenting skills? Are you, are our future and parents need help? So um, those aren't, there's not specific recommendations around that in the plan, but I would say um, in several of the goals, there are recommendations with that, you know, depend on our partner agencies in both the city and the county in providing greater access to schools and, and um, economics and job skills and all those kinds of things, not particularly to parenting, but um, we do partner with predominantly, I think that would be either, you know, kind of third sector organizations like the United Way and, and those, and then also some of the county organizations. And we do, we do partner with those organizations um, and have spoken to those organizations to see how we can strengthen the work that they do. And then Weston had a question, what plans or proposals are being made to expand the availability of affordable housing in non-poor neighborhoods and use housing vouchers to enable low-income families to move to better locations? So kind of around the first part of what you're saying there, I think the whole um, concept that we're talking about here and broadening the variety of housing types that are available within single family neighborhoods kind of gets at that expanding the availability. Um, it's not really just an affordability issue like we've been talking about. Um, the housing vouchers is really something more, I think, on the um, kind of like the federal side in terms of like the housing authority. Um, but there's not anything that, you know, in our plan that would prohibit somebody from using a voucher. Um, I think that's more of an agreement between um, ex the property owner accepting a voucher um, from the housing authority, then there would be anything that our plan could really speak to. And then Janaris had a comment saying that metrics and scorecards are key, as well as effective go-to green plans where we take immediate action if we don't meet thresholds. And I think um, we would agree with that as, as we were saying, you know, we fully anticipate that we'll be continually evaluating and monitoring and reporting as Alicia said and being transparent on um, where we are in terms of achieving the goals that we've set out in our policies and recommendations. And then Weston said, how, how will we provide information and incentives to encourage white and minority households to broaden their horizons and consider living in diverse neighborhoods? I guess as far as that goes, I would say really making it more available. And I think a large part of what we're trying to do here is um, getting out accurate messages around what the single family and housing diversity and inclusion goal, um, what the policies are within that. Um, kind of as Alicia said, there's nothing that says eliminate in there. So there is some misinformation out there around that. And again, a lot of that is in our ambassador toolkit, which I think um, the link to that is posted in the chat. And I, had then, a quick, I had a quick question before oh. it gets too late. <laughs> um, I, I was on the meeting on February 23rd and um, I was kind of my left, left me kind of head spinning a little bit. Um, we were pump, bumping along with the meeting. You, you ladies do always do a really great job. And then Ishmael came on and it seemed like to me that there was a split. I was kind of like, I, I wasn't sure what really happened. And um, I don't know. It, it just seemed like you were like, I'm going to turn it over to Ishmael. And then they were kind of against this 2040 plan a little bit and then they were my my other concern is is they were saying that Myers Park and some of the higher um 
the, the Myers Park, Valentine are gonna be fighting the 2040 plan. My question is if those, the people over there can afford attorneys and they fight the 2040 and they don't want the duplexes and the triplexes, will that just be, will we be where we are now where there's a rich side of town and a poor side of town? The Myers Park won't have the duplexes and the triplexes and the West side will have the, I, I'm just, I'm the elephant in the room and I know you guys hate that I, cause we were, we were zooming along with no complications and here I am. <laughs> Sorry ladies. No, 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 Jody. I appreciate it cause um, one appreciate, um, I guess your recollection of what actually happened cause it, it was exactly how you accounted for. And what, and the, this conversation today started off with, is this a community driven plan? And yes, and, and for all the reasons you just described. So those are neighborhoods within our community. So everyone, the way we've been approaching the process is um, really understanding that there are groups in our, our city that are typically engaged in these types of processes for whatever reasons. Access to information, uh, more investment in what happens, but then there are groups who are not at the table. And our process has been to make sure we engage those who are typically there, but then ask who's not here and make sure we hear their voices as well. So a lot of the conversations are around um, my neighborhood and we're gonna oppose the plan um, or oppose the principles in the plan because I don't see how it benefits me. The other part of that, the flip side of that is I support the plan. I see how it benefits me. I want to voice that opinion. And so you witness both of that happening at the same time, which is, which is the, the, the good part of, of, of building community. Everybody's not the same. Everybody has a difference of opinion is finding that common ground uh, and, and having this uh, dialogue about how to, how to get there. And, um, and so what our role is in this whole process is not to mute people who aren't in agreement, but to make sure that we understand both sides and see how we can meet in the middle. I think at the end of that call, what was understood on both sides of the coin is that we all want vibrant communities. We all want safe neighborhoods, safe, clean neighborhoods. And it will vary what that looks like depending on who you are as an individual. But from a, a, a policy perspective and a city perspective, we just have to provide that opportunity for creating that vibrancy, that thriving neighborhood, that inclusion, that access to amenities, those programs that support it if that makes sense. So you witnessed all that happening. <laughs> and I know, I saw your face, you were a little like, what is happening here? But um, that's part of the process. Um, and uh, you just have to find, help people find that middle ground because, um, and do it in a respectful way. Um, I mean, um, I was, I, I was at the, um, Kimberly that was our speaker. That was one of her things is that she said that they cut her, their kind of city up into eight groups and, and each group had the same, like they spread everything around and that made a healthy community. I can totally understand where that is. It's just my concern is, is um, on our side of town, there's probably not gonna be a lot of attorneys being sought after. And then if, if they win these cases, or is that gonna be more duplexes and triplexes on are we going to be off kilter, out of balance on that? Instead of it being spread evenly, like Kimberly was saying, for a healthy, vibrant community all over, will that just be, you know, will it be one-sided like it is now? Yeah, that's what, that's the controversy in the plan, is that if we're thinking about diversity in our community as we grow, much of that diversity already exists. It just looks different in different places. Um, 
how do we do that everywhere and not just in certain places? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Weston had another question and then um, we need to wrap up a little bit. Are we planning to target public investments to equalize the quality of all neighborhoods and give all residents access to services opportunities available? Yes. Um, there's a portion of the plan that talks about the equitable growth framework and um, how we need to address our areas of greatest needs with our investments to create a, a more vibrant Charlotte. And um, there's a whole series of, of what of metrics that say, here's what we look like today. And when we map the place types or the types of places we want to see, the equitable growth framework will kind of guide um, or influence how we put growth and investments in those locations. So yes. Well, what criteria are you guys going to be considering to oh. uh, establish that? That uh, what, what who's who needs what or what are you guys be looking at as far to determine? Well, this this neighborhood needs this particular service or needs that. This neighborhood's okay. So so Weston, there's um, four big indicators in that in the equity metrics um, that say um, here are some of the things we need to look at in that area of disinvestment or traditionally marginalized communities. Like, here's what we need to look at. There are, um, I wanna say, probably 50 or 60 indicators around access to goods and services, like daycare, grocery stores, those types of things. Access to housing opportunity, access to employment, and then environmental justice. And then there's a whole bunch of different layers of data. It's all in the plan um, that helps support that. We will, through another community process, once the plan is adopted, help prioritize different areas and the types and think about what types of investments um, we need to address in those areas. So that's a, a separate process that the community will participate in and making those decisions. So we won't unilaterally go back to the office and say, all right, here you go. This is what's gonna happen. We'll work with the community in making those decisions. So um, please stay engaged for that implementation part of the plan, if that makes sense. It does, it does, thank you. Okay, you're welcome. I think Bobby had his hand up and then. Sure, just one quick comment. And also this is just an incredible undertaking and um, planning also is driving it but are other departments kind of supporting y'all because it seems like so much of this is well beyond planning and of course much of it's really driven by the private sector but are other city departments very engaged in a lot of these kind of long-term controls or monitoring for lack of a better word yeah so um as i mentioned earlier there's a lot of other plans going on not only um, other city departments, but county departments and other agencies. And we are partners in all of those. And the conference of plan is a umbrella document really for those. And then as part of phase three, developing the plan policies and recommendations, we had a interdepartmental team that probably had close to 50 other staff from various departments across the city. And, and, county. We've, and county, and we've continued that in the implementation plan. And we will con continue that as we move forward in implementing the plan. Thank you, that was my question, thanks. We're at time, people. Um, Kathy? Do you, do you wanna put, Alicia, is it too much the slide for the, um, Next Charles step. Hales, which is, so we've had community conversations because I think um, a lot of folks have heard more than their share from our staff and our consultants. So um, <laughs> we shifted our community conversations to also include um, other experts from around the country. So Kimberly Driggins and with her experience and the Washington DC Conference of Plan and also in Detroit. 
and then Paul Magoosh from uh, Minneapolis. And if you miss those, those are uh, there's recordings of those available on our Facebook page. And then next week we'll be hearing from Charles Hales, who is the former mayor of Portland, Oregon, and who is now with HDR, which is a local planning, um, well, national planning and engineering firm. So that'll be at 11.30 on Tuesday, March 9th. I think that's a Tuesday. In addition to that, um, the city manager's office is hosting two kind of town hall citywide community conversations um, on March 16th at noon and then at 5.30. Um, and you can participate in those using our YouTube channel, Gov channel, or through the Facebook page. So we hope you will participate in those as well. We're very thankful to you for your time this afternoon as well. And Alicia and I are available. I think, Alicia, if you can maybe go to the end, our email addresses and contact information are available yeah. there as well. We'll send I can put them um, in the chat. Yeah. Are there any cities that have examples of a Kimberly neighborhood? The, the ten minute neighborhood, Miss Maddie, is space is very much a national standard. Um, so we have looked at, you know, Denver and Minneapolis and San Antonio and others. To be honest with you, I don't remember like off the top of my head if they had an actual 10 minute neighborhood goal, but I would want to say that they they probably do. Um, it is just, you know, a national best practice. All right. Thank you all again. And I've put um, my email in Alicia's um, if there's other things that questions or thoughts that pop into your mind after this. We hope to see you on the 9th and on the 16th as well. But thank you very much for your time this afternoon.